Hello, hello. Hello. Hi. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, yeah, hopefully you guys are able to hear me. Uh, I think let's get started today. Charlie is uh, on travel today, so I'm taking up, I'll be, uh, let's say, covering for him today in the lecture for the post-processing and some bit of finite element. And you'll see a little more in the CFD class. You probably saw me in the thermodynamics tutorial a couple of days ago. And, uh, okay, so let's get started with what we have today. So just to give a brief recap, I think you've probably been doing a little bit of uh, frames and structures with your finite element. I think Charlie did started with what is finite element, I think, in the first class. Why do we need to do finite elements? And at the end of the day, probably last class, you talked about frames and trusses and how to set up a finite element problem with frames and trusses. Okay. So what are we going to do today is like, trying to understand, so you get some results out of these finite element, probably, I guess, you probably already had your finite element labs as well, where you went into ANSYS, put something in there, press the button, compute, and then you got a color picture, right? At the end of the day, as engineers, you want to understand what this color picture means and how you can use them. Otherwise, it's just any color picture and it's just a waste of time, okay? So what we are going to try to understand today is just one part of it, trying to see how you can use these color pictures to make some sense in engineering design, right? So let's just take a brief uh, recap of what we have done so far. Uh, I'll probably give you a little bit of a different perspective, probably maybe than what Charlie has been talking about. Uh, okay. So, so what, what do you understand of finite element in a way, right? So he said, like, okay, we are doing finite elements, but what what is finite element essentially doing, right? So you probably had your class on solid mechanics or structural mechanics in the first grade. You had some strength of materials, right? So you talked about some beam models, you said, okay, we have a beam, let's say we have a beam, and we're going to apply some kind of a cantilever load uh, on this beam. The cantilever beam, we're going to apply some kind of a load, or probably some kind of, a, let's say we apply a distributed load. And then we wanted to calculate, let's say, what's the deflection of this beam as a function of x. So this is our x-axis, so this is our y-axis, the deflection, and then you have some equation that gave you these deflections, right? So at the end of the day, so when we can write these things, so why do we need to be something complicated as finite elements method? So what is it doing exactly? So when you solve this equation, if you remember, go back and try to remember, you have some or some differential equation, right? So most of you are probably will get lost at this point, but then just hold on for a second, okay? So you have some equation that says some something with regard to some x to the power 4 or x to the power square or something, something like EI into something, right? So you had this equation and then you could solve it and get your deflection equation, right? So, but then in most, this is a very simple scenario where you can solve this equation analytically or with hand and get an expression, but then that's not always possible in a realistic scenario and that is the reason you're going to do a finite element method, right? Okay, so that, that sounds pretty nice statement to say. But what am I doing in the finite element method? Am I doing some magic in there that I go to a computer, give something, and that give, it solves me all these, whatever, whatever it is solving it, right? So at the end of the day, if you think about it, so what do we have here? We have what we call as a differential equation. You'll see a little more of this when we go into the CFD. I'll probably go into a little more details of that, but I just want to recap what Charlie has done and kind of give you a different perspective and take on the post-processing from there, right? So, okay. Give a second. Okay. That should do it. Okay. So now, what's the differential equation? So if you look at it, probably you have something like some e some terms like d by dx, d by dy, d by dz, d by dt, maybe the second order and third order and fourth order and so on, right? So we are in the xyz space and something is changing with regard to time, right? So we have some quantity here, let's say for example I'll call it u, I'll call this as displacement, right? 
So we have some quantity u, or for example, in your beam problem that we did here, let's say we have a beam, simple beam, on which we are applying some kind of a cantilever load, and we are getting some deflection, y, right? So the beam bends, and then there's a deformed shape, and then we are calculating this deflection as, let's say, y, okay? So now, we want to calculate how is dy changing over x. So this is our x-axis, right? So all that is changing, it's telling us is how fast is y changing along the x-direction. It's a derivative, or it's a tangent. If, you, if I draw a curve, y versus x, it is nothing but a tangent at every point, in mathematically to think about, or physically to think about how fast is y changing with x. As I move along x, how fast is y changing? That's all it is changing, telling me. Similarly, I can have a, let's say if I was applying some kind of a dynamic load here, let's say a naught sine of omega t, right? So this could be dy by dt. For example, if you're thinking of a car, then essentially the car is moving on a road, which is applying some forces on you, on your car, and whatever uh, vibration damping system you have in your car that is taking these forces, making, you, making it feel that you have a really smooth ride, and you're not feeling any of the bumps from the road, right? So there's like a time-dependent loading that's being applied there. So there some kind of, let's say, A dot sine omega t. So then we are looking at how is this deflection changing with time. So what's the, what's the differential equation? It's basically going to say, let's say, if you were to combine a lot of these different terms, and say, let's say, equal to zero, okay? So it is basically combining how is some quantity, for example, in our, most of our solid mechanics, you will be interested in what, how is displacement changing with space in x direction, in y direction and z direction, and how is it changing with time. Now when you go into the fluid mechanics, which is the second part of this uh, module, you will be thinking more in terms of velocities rather than in terms of displacements. Now, the question we will answer, uh, ask is can finite element method be used to do fluid mechanics? Any thoughts there? Yes, it can be done. But probably we'll look at that in the second part of it. So we'll do like other methods called finite difference method, finite volume method in the next year. And we'll also, I'll give you some ideas of how finite element method can also be used. So but then we have all been talking about solid mechanics, you know, and you know, solid objects, and saying that we are doing finite element method, right? So for example, what's the differential equation? It's basically combining how a quantity is changing in space and how it is changing in time. In solid mechanics, we are concerned about the displacement. If I take a solid object, it has a reference shape, right? So this apple pencil, this is the reference shape of the apple pencil. If I kind of apply a force, then it's going to bend and then eventually break. I don't want to do that. Uh, then the, each of these points are going to have a deflection. If I hold on one and apply a load, then each point has a deflection. Then I'm going to say, with this, uh, regard to this reference shape, right? The shape that was not deformed or undeformed or reference shape, this is my deformed shape. Right? So for example, if uh, let, let's take yeah, so this is probably easier to see. This is my reference shape or undeformed shape. I do something like this. Now there's a change in shape. Now I can measure with regard to this reference shape what is the change in shape. Right? So that's my displacement. Now in fluids. Now, I have a bottle of water. This is the shape of the water. If I drop it down, that's the shape of the water. It has no reference shape. So I cannot really say with regard to this reference shape, there is a displacement. So that is the reason when you go into fluids, you talk in terms of velocities. You're taking a single particle and seeing how this particle is going to travel. For example, when I drop the water, I can take a particle and see how it traveled in there. Right? I can look at the velocity of that particle. Right? So it's more intuitive, more easier. So in solid mechanics, things are more easier because we have a reference shape to think about. Right? So with regard to our reference shape, we have a displacement. Now, since our body has x, y, and z dimension, and maybe we are applying some time-dependent loading, right? so we want to see how is this displacement changing in x, y, and z, and time. So then we write a mathematical equation, which we call a differential equation. Let's not even write one for now, right? So let's just call it a DE, right? So where's it gone? Ah, okay. So let's just say we have a differential equation. It's more accurate to say a partial differential equation. I don't want to lose half the class at that point, so let's call it a differential equation, right? Now, 
you are saying I'm going to solve this with a finite element method, right? When you had a beam problem, you took the equation, you integrated this differential equation, got an equation for deflection. Now, what is your finite element method doing, right? It's not doing any magic, but it's solving the same differential equation, but a computer is doing it for you. Now, how does a computer know? A computer doesn't know how to solve a differential equation. What does a computer know? It knows how to do addition. You give it two numbers. So, we'll take a calculator from your mobile. You can, what, what can you do from a basic calculator? I can do 1 plus 2, I can do addition, I can do subtraction, I can do multiplication. Okay? These are three most important fundamental things that you can do. Or if I have like sets of numbers, or if you have an array of numbers, for example, let's say I have some number A and number B, I can do A plus B, A minus B, or A into B. Now, if I have a set of numbers, let's say A, B, C, so on, then I, let's say, let's say, call this as set 1, and set 2, let's say D, E, F, and so on, then I can do set 1 plus set 2, set 1 minus set 2, set 1 into set 2, right? Again, this, uh, we, uh, so this is something already I've done in your linear algebra, right? Or this sets can be matrices. I have here vectors. It can be matrices. So what can a computer do is it can add matrices, subtract matrices, and multiply matrices, right? You give a numbers, it can add, subtract, and multiply them, right? So now, but it doesn't know how to solve a differential equation. You need to tell it, if you tell, hey, here's my differential equation, solve it for me, it's going to just give you, it's, it's not going, it doesn't recognize it. Right? For example, I'm talking to you in English. For example, if I talk to you in my mother tongue, which is called Kannada, uh, I don't think anybody here would understand that. Right? We need to start speaking in the same language. That's our language is English. We need to tell a computer in a language that it understands and it can compute. So that's what is a matrix equation. So we need to write it in a matrix form. Right? So what are we doing here when we do finite element? We are taking our differential equation and writing, writing it into a matrix equation. If you remember back in your trusses and frames class, I think if I looked at the video that Charlie has taught, he probably eventually ended up some equation that says k into u equal to f, right? So this is a force vector. This is a stiffness matrix. And this is your displacements. Right? But this U can be anything. It can be velocity, it can be pressure, it can be temperature, it can be your electromagnetic field, it can be anything. It's a list of unknowns. In your frames and trusses problem, you had a truss and each point you wanted to get a displacement. Right? So your unknown was displacement. So we called it a US displacement. Right? Because we started thinking of this in terms of springs and stuff like that, we said the K matrix is a stiffness matrix because spring has a stiffness. So it's more intuitive to think of it that way. So, and this form k into x equal to f is something that we again get from our spring force equation. So, it's intuitive that we are saying we have a spring with some stiffness k and we are applying some displacement u and this, or we are applying some force f which is giving a displacement u, right? So, it's very intuitive to think of things that way. So, we call this this. But in general, this is nothing but your, what we call as a degree of freedom, right? Or unknown. It can be any unknown. In our solid mechanics, this is our displacement. If you go into fluid mechanics, it will be your velocity and pressure. If you want to do a heat transfer or thermal problem, it can be your temperatures. Or if you want to do electromagnetics problem, it's your electric field and so on. Right? So the whole idea here, so this was your finite element method. All your finite element method did, in general, to think of it, is took your differential equation. Probably in your truss problem, you wouldn't see that. So if you go into a 1D or a 2D problem, you'll see this a little more clearly. I think that's probably going to be introduced in your uh, Modsim 3, and from next year that will be introduced in Modsim 2 itself. So there you'll probably be introduced to what's called as a weak form. I don't know if they'll be doing it in the next class, but then at least you'll, be, you'll get that before you finish. And there you'll be introduced to how you convert your, let's say, a partial differential equation or a differential equation that describes your physical phenomena into a matrix equation that your finite element is solving. So now, this finite element is just one numerical method, right? So I can use any method. I can use a finite difference method, finite volume method, 
smooth and particle hydrodynamics, lots of them. Right? For example, in the next part of the class, we'll look at finite difference method in the second half of this module, where we we'll look at finite difference, and in the next year, you'll be looking at finite volume. So it is not that finite element is restricted to solids, and finite difference is restricted to fluids, or finite volume is only fluids. It is just a numerical method, right? It is just like an interpreter, right? So when you write a program, you give compile, it is writing everything into a machine level language. You know, so it's an interpreter. It's interpreting something into a language that the machines can understand, right? So, so that's let's say a very very crude, very big overview of thinking of finite element, right? Now, so now with this general idea that we have about finite element, I think I also have a brief overview of what we what Charlie had done you know, in a lot more higher level way, let's try to think of what we can do to post-process. So you're an engineer, so what's expected of you is to, you're going to do some design. Let's say you're going to design a car or a jet or an aircraft or a hypersonic plane. You don't want it to fail, right? So you don't want a rocket to just take off and just like crash land right there. You know, you're, you start driving your car and all the parts start coming out, right? You don't want to do that. So that's where you as an engineer come in to say, can the structure take care of the prescribed loads on the structure, right? So in this part, we're primarily focusing on solid mechanics, and we want to understand how do we make sure that our structure is good enough that it can take the uh, loads that we're prescribing on the structure. So that's what it says. So is the FEA method general? Yes, we can, as we saw, it's just a method that's converting our partial differential equations into a matrix form or a form that the computer can understand. Right? So if you go to linear algebra, it's nothing but your linear algebra. Okay. So you have a matrix, so please don't get lost. So you can solve thermal problems, you can solve fluid problems, electric field, magnetic field, anything. It depends on the governing equations you are. So now is finite element good enough for all of these? That's a different question, right? If I have a hammer and I want to put a nail into the wall, it's a good tool. If I have a hammer and I want to saw wood with it, I can still do it. I can hammer it so that it breaks into two pieces, but it's not as good a tool as a saw, right? If you're going to cut a wood into two pieces, you want to get a saw there to cut it rather than a hammer to beat it into two pieces. So there are pros and cons of every method that you use. Some method works well for something. Some method might not work well for something. It's not a magic tool, right? So what you need to understand is what can it work for? And more importantly, what does it not work for? Now, knowing what it works for is good. But knowing what it doesn't work for is the best thing, right? right? So that's, that's, that's what you need to learn as an engineer in a way, right? So you can't just keep using finite element for everything, but then you need to know if it works for something or if it doesn't work for something. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So purpose of the uh, finite element post-processing. Okay. So I'm just taking Charlie's slides here because I didn't want to uh, destroy his flow of the classes. So I'm just taking his slides and kind of uh, giving it to you in there. Uh, so he says, he says that it's a post-processing regime is a paradigm for transforming the often highly detailed and complex outputs of finite element calculation into a format that is easily understood by the user. Right? So, but uh, eventually at the end of the day, he says the outputs of post-processing may be used in engineering judgments or analysis as part of validity, functionality, checks, or more, FEM. Cool. Okay, so I just wanted to read that out just to see. Uh, just to give you some time to process that. But at the end of the day, what are we doing in post-processing? Like I said, we did some simulation, we got some nice pictures, and we want to know first see if this picture makes sense, right? Like for example, simple, sim think of simple thing. I'm going to take a material, and I'm going to apply a tensile load. I'm going to start pulling it, right? But then your simulation says that the displacement is negative. I'm going to apply a tensile force on that, but simulation says the displacements are negative, which means that it's undergoing compression, right? Can you have a scenario like that? You will say no, but you will probably end up with some finite element simulation that can give you that, right? Because you are using the wrong, let's say, elements in there, wrong technologies, or let's, let's not go into the detail, but some, something is wrong inside there. And that can lead you to a lot of things. Right? So it can give you, like, I can apply a load, I can get a zero displacement. Right? So the, all these things happen. So this is called a locking effect that you will probably, it's, it's a more, uh, you'll probably see in the next year where you'll have something called a locking effect. So for example, if you take a rubber material, it's a, it's a hyper, it's a incompressible material, it's like water. If I put it into a block and kind of try to press on it, the volume will not change, volume will remain constant, right? It's an incompressible material. So now, if I try to do a simulation with whatever you would be doing in the lab, 
you will end up with near zero displacements. Nothing is ever zero on a computer, but you're near zero displacements. It's called volumetric locking. So, but then, as an engineer, you say, okay, no, I apply so much of force. If I think of the Higgs modulus of this in, let's say, let's say the one or 10 MPa, and I'm applying so much of force on this area, so this should be my stress. So technically, I should at least have a strain of this much, right? So if you just think cru crudely, stress is equal to Higgs modulus into strain, and I'm going to apply a stress on some area of one by one meter, a force, let's say, F on one by one meter, I should be able to calculate what should be the strain, but my computer is giving different, right? So that is where you come in as an engineer to not just take the result that the computer gives in, but analyze if this result makes sense firstly. Right. So that's what we call as validation. You need to understand, okay, I'm getting a result that seems reasonable. Right. Let's do a hand calculation to say, okay, it seems reasonable. Second thing is, okay, now this, whatever I'm doing seems reasonable, let me use that to do a more complicated problem with the same kind of materials and same kind of, uh, let's say, mesh and so on. Right. So, for example, if you have mesh, you might uh, be able to mesh with a linear element, quadratic element, and so on. And there are lots of other options you will see if you go and go back to your answers and have a look at it. There's something called uh, reduced integration and a lot of these other things. Now, you might just put something in there and get something out, but once you are sure that it's giving a reasonable result for the kind of problem you're doing, then you want to run the actual problem that you do and then get your stresses and strains. So you never calculate your stress and strain, but this is more of a post-processing quantity. You can always calculate your displacement, right? So like we saw, we are only calculating our displacements here, right? So we solve this displacement equation, we are only calculating for our displacements. That's our primary unknown. Okay, probably that didn't change, but okay. Right? So from our displacements, we want to get our stresses and we want to get our strains. Okay? Any questions or thoughts so far? Okay. Okay, so let's just take a simple example of a pin jointed frame that uh, that's being used. And so what, what did we do there? So we need to solve this. And so what did we start with? We said we are going to start with uh, putting the geometry in there. So what's the geometry? What's the length of the, each of these elements? What is the area of cross, area of cross sectional area of these elements? Right? So then we said we'll define the material model. So we need to be very careful when we say material model. Material model is not material itself. It is just a description that, let's say, similar, that, that, is, uh, that can, let's say, that gives you a force displacement behavior similar to the actual material. For example, let's say steel has a Higgs modulus of 210 GPA, but then steel also undergoes plasticity, right? If you keep pulling, if you've done a uniaxial test, you will see that uh, if you take a very ductile material and you keep pulling it, there, there's a cone and a cup form, a necking form, and then it eventually breaks. So if you look at the force displacement curve, there's initially a linear region, and then there's a nonlinear region, right? So your Higgs modulus only describes your linear region, but does not describe your nonlinear region. So now we need to think about uh, material model very carefully. So now is my displacement, is the force I'm applying keeping my material displacement within that linear region. If I'm going to say it's a linear elastic material with Higgs modulus of so and so, then I'm by default saying that my displacement, the behavior between my stress and strain is always linear, right? It doesn't matter how much load I apply. But then after a certain load, your material might not be behaving linearly, right? It might start to undergo plasticity, it might undergo yielding, it might not even break. Right? So by putting a material model in there, you are saying that this is the limit of what I can do. Right? So for example, let's say if something starts to yield at 0.5%, metal starts to yield very, very fast. Right? For example, if you take elastic rubber material, it, you can pull it till 700% and push, uh, bring it back and then there's no, there's no plasticity, there's no yielding effect. Either, right? So you need to think of what material you are using, what is the model that prescribes that, right? that, that, that describes that, not prescribes, sorry. Finally, element type. So here you are talking about, uh, I'm using a linear element, I'm using a quadratic element, right? So what is my mesh density? For example, I can have a very sharp point. I need to make sure that everything around the sharp point, there's more mesh in there, or like, you know, mesh is more refined there. Now we'll talk about mesh convergence as we go on, right? So we need to think about how we are meshing and what kind of element are we using in there. So should, we, should I always use a higher order element? You know, is that always a solution? Or like second order element, does it always give me higher accuracy? 
or can I stick to a first order element? Right. So that's always a question that uh, always comes up. So if I just use second order element, do I get a higher, better accuracy? Probably not. Right. Sometimes the first order element can work better than second order element. Right. So, okay. So second thing, once you have preserved all of this, you're going to put some boundary conditions. Here our boundary conditions are nodes two and three are fixed, and we are applying a load of 500 newtons on node one. Okay. So that's our boundary condition. We are going to fix it, which means that we are saying the displacements at node two and three, both in the x and y direction here are zero. I can have some kind of a roller joint which might say allow it to go up and down in a particular direction, right? But then here we can see from the figure that it's completely fixed. So ux in, of the node two and uy of node two is zero. ux of node three and uy of node three are also zero. So only node that's allowed to move is probably node number one or like kind of like uh, here the point number one. Uh, let's not call it a node, let's call it a point. Point number two and point number three are fixed, and point number one, uh, one can move. Now we are going to mesh each of these elements in there, right? So we are, uh, and then finally we want to do the post processing, and uh, we want to solve, apply boundary conditions, solve, and then you want to do the post processing, right? So that's what we have not done so far, and once you do the post processing, one of the most uh, uh, familiar questions that come up with is my structure going to fail, right? So a simple thing to think about, is my structure going to hold the load or is it going to fail? And what is the maximum load that this structure can take in there? Right? So that's what we are trying to, going to answer today. We want to see how can we understand if a structure will fail, what are the criteria that we can think about, and uh, how, do, how do we go about answering this question? If I apply a load, I'll get a displacement, I'll solve, go to finite element, press solve, it'll give me a displacement. But now I don't know if the structure has failed or not. Because I've used a linear elastic material, which means my stress strain behavior is always going to be linear. I can stretch till infinity, it, it, it's just going to give me a linear behavior. So, but then that's not true, right? At some point, if you keep applying a load, at some point it's going to break. It's not going to go linearly till infinity, right? So how do we identify what would be the, what would be the question that we should ask here as to how do we calculate what should be the maximum strain, maximum load, when will my structure fail, how do we compare with that? So we need some kind of a standard comparison to do that, right? Okay. Okay, so we, I'll not go through the calculation, but then there's probably a very simple truss calculation that you guys have done already in your strength of materials, and I don't think it's too complicated for you to do. So let's say if you applied a load of 500 newtons, you can get the original load member in there, you can get also the displacements of these members, and let's say our strains are so-and-so, uh, 333 into 10 power minus 6, 173 into 10 power minus 6, which is very reasonably very small, and if you're assuming our range modulus of about uh, 210 GPA, Kilopascals, okay. So I think that should be 10 to the power 9 pascals, not 10 to the power 3. I'll ask Tori to correct that. Uh, that would be 210 GPA, which is about steel. Uh, so then you should end up with something like 34.6 MPA, because that's 10 to the power minus 6 in there. So, yeah, I would guess so. Uh, 210. So that should be 200 GPA, 200 into 10 power 9. Uh, yeah, so there's something wrong there, yeah. Okay, so now, does this stress tell you anything about that? So the question is, we have this load, there's a tensile load and a compressive load that should probably be much less kilopascals rather than megapascals. So would that still tell you anything about if the structure will fail or not? Any thoughts? Yeah? Yeah, you're, you need to multiply 333 into 10 power minus 6 yes. into 200 into 10 power 3 that will be 10 to the power minus 3, right? So this will be 200 into 333. No, the uh, minus 6 will be times 10 to the minus 6. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, sorry, sorry, it's right. So he's already deleted. So, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So this, this should have been 200 into 10 to the power 9 GPA into 333.4 into 10 to the power minus 6. So, yeah, you're right. Yeah. And also, to add on to this whole thing. Sorry? Also, to add on to this whole thing, to find the failure structure, to find if the structure will fail, you're going to need to, because this is a one-dimensional solver, 
you're going to need to compare it against some kind of a, some kind of failure stress, right? Okay. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So you're starting to get into that direction. We need to compare it with some kind of a failure stress. So how do we find a failure stress? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, in order to understand like how the structure would fail, this is one of the very common tests that are done. You do a uniaxial tensile test for the kind of material that you're using. Let's say, yeah, so this is what I was calling. So you pull the specimen, you can see that it undergoes a necking. So you can see that the real area in the middle starts to reduce. And So that's the necking part of it. So you can see that there's a neck that's formed. And once this breaks, you can see like a cone, like a structure, and a cup like a structure. So something like a cup on one side, there's like a cone on the other side. So there's like a cup and cone structure that fails. And so that kind of gives us an idea. So these kind of experiments gives us an idea to think about what would be the maximum stress that this structure could take, in a way. Right? So, but then again, we want to add some kind of a factor of safety. So generally, people can, so for example, here our uh, failure criteria was about 150 MPA, and the load being 6.6, .6, we could compute that the factor of safety was about uh, 2.2 times, which is uh, still not. Right. Yeah, 2.2 times, right? So, uh, but at the end of the day, so this is basically a very, very simple idea to think about a 1D failure, right? So you have a single structure, but then you seldom have like these kind of single directional structure, right? So then we want to think about more like a 2D failure rather than looking at uh, uh, 1D failure in a way. So for example, for example, whatever you did with uh, frames and trusses, this kind of a 1D, structure, 1D idea works. If my stress is greater than uh, some kind of a failure stress, then it will fail. If it's less than that, it doesn't fail. You know, very, very one-dimensional way of thinking. But seldom do you have a 1D structure, right? So if you're thinking of a building here in McD and say that, okay, when will this fall? This then you probably cannot take an analysis like that and say that, okay, my McD structure will fall or not fall. So you need a slightly little more complicated way of thinking when these materials might fail and when they might not fail and so on, right? Okay, so let's just move a little bit from there. To talk about failure criteria, Okay, so this is what we did so far. We thought, talked about uh, looking at how structures fail in a 1D way, right? But then that's not the most interesting part of it. Neither for me nor for you, to be honest, right? Uh, so we'll try to think about how does at least 2D fail. It's slightly a little more complicated. And I'll probably go to revise some of your concepts that you've done in your strength of materials or mechanics of materials equivalent course. Uh, where you're talking about principal stresses. Did you guys do principal stresses before, or no? Sir, yeah? yes we did. Okay, good, good. Okay, so you probably have done already that, so it just, just to briefly talk about that. So what are we saying when we have principal stresses? We are essentially saying that, uh, let's say if we take any kind of 2D element here, and we are going to apply a general state of stress. What we see is a general state of stress. So the stress in x direction, stress y direction. So you're taking a single uh, very infinitesimal uh, element. And you're looking at what are the forces by the force by area on each of these faces. So you have a sigma xx, yy, and then you have a shear stress tau xy, right? So now I can rotate this element by a certain angle such that I only have a normal stresses on the surface, right? So why do I want to think about these only normal stresses? As you can see here, once we rotated our element by theta, then we only have sigma 1 and sigma 2. And uh, this is of interest to us, now we have, because we reduced our two-dimensional problem into somewhat a one-dimension analog of it, right? So what did we talk about previously? We said if the stress is greater than some failure stress, then it's going to fail. Very easy criteria to think about, very easy criteria to investigate. And what we have done using our Mohr circle, or like using our idea of principal stresses, is we have taken our element and rotated by angle theta, and such that we calculate our principal stresses, and our principal stresses represent nothing but 
the, there are the stresses on the particular phase where you don't have any shear stress. So you have one dimensional state of stress of, in a way to kind of think about. So you have only sigma one, right? And you have only sigma two on the face in the two direction. Which means that now I can say, I will look at, use this to calculate what should be my maximum principal stress and minimum principal stress. And say if my, fa if my uh, failure criteria for the material is less than the maximum principal stress, then the structure might not fail. It's so a very simple way of thinking about it, but then brings in a nice more uh, easier uh, way to think of things, right? So if you're going to go back to revise our Moore, uh, Moore circle concept, just a quick revision so that uh, everybody's on the same page. So we are given a simple stress state, state condition here. So let's just try to write it out here. Okay. So let's say we have an element. And we have sigma x, x is, let's say, minus 60, sigma y, y is 80, and tau x, y is 70. So, right, so I've just taken the same example and tried to put it here, just to get us back on the same page to think about more circle and how we can use it to think of how to post-process and how to, let's say, think of engineering design in terms of whatever a finite element would give us, right? So let's say we go back here. So we establish a simple axis of tau and of tau and sigma. Now I'm going to pick up a point that says here, let's say, uh, sigma xx comma tau xy, right? So there's nothing but minus 60 comma 70. And I'm also going to pick up something like uh, sigma yy and tau xy, right? So we're going to two, pick up two points here. Oh, sorry, minus, minus tau xy, right, yeah. This line need not necessarily pass through zero, right? So I'm just going to draw a line in there, but then I'm, let's, let's try to avoid passing this through zero. So this is uh, 80 comma 70. And so the midpoint of that is uh, Bad drawing, but then essentially, and I'm going to use this as my center to draw a circle. Right. So that's what we did when we drew our more circle in there. So we said this is our. We took the two states states of stresses, one on x face, and one on the y face, and we used those two as the two points of the circle, and uh, used our a point that coincided with x-axis to draw a circle in there, which we call as a Mohr circle. And then we said, this is our maximum principal stress and our minimum principal stress. And we said, okay, so this was our maximum shear stress. Right? Okay, so let's assume that there's a circle in there. And so that gave us our sigma max and sigma uh, minimum, right? So if that's our principal stress, sigma one and sigma two,
<laughs> so now I know the maximum principal stress acting on any single plane. I'm able to calculate if the structure is going to fail in fail. But then we have to be careful here because these principal stresses are normal to the plane, which means that we are only looking at failure by tens tension or by compression, right? So if you want to have a failure by shear, then you need to look at, for example, here, what's your tau max? So that's your failure by shear. For example, if I take a scissor, and right, for example, if I, if I tear a paper, right, let's say if I take this paper, and I'm going to tear this, I'm not applying a tensile load, I'm applying a shear load here. Right? If I do this, then I'm, I'm applying a tensile load. Right? So now you need to be careful about what, what, what is the load of failure. Is it a shear? Is it a shear? Or is it a tensile thing? Right? So this tension, right? So if it's like, or if it could be compression. For example, if, uh, if you're looking at concrete kind of materials, then they fail in compression. They don't fail in, uh, I mean, they fail much faster in tension, but then they're not used for tension, but then they're used more for compress, compressive loads. Right? So you need to be careful about what is the loads, uh, or not just what is the principal stress and what is the maximum shear stress, but also what is the mode of failure which is common to these kind of materials that you are looking at, right? to these kind of structures that you are looking at. So, okay. so, so let's, let's take a quick five minute break here just to stretch your legs and if somebody has any questions then I'm here to answer that. So it's about 13.43, we can come back at 13.50 and continue from there.
Okay, so let's get started back. Uh, right? So we talked about some idea of uh, more stresses. We talked about more stresses last uh, just a few minutes ago, and that provides us some idea of uh, multi-axial loading, particularly when we are looking at uh, 2D failure criteria. Right? Okay, so we called it a maximum principal stress failure criteria, and we said if the stress is greater than some form of a, uh, the maximum, if the princi maximum principal stress is greater than the failure criteria, then the structure fails, right? But then we know, so f this is what we wrote here, we said, uh, based on our, uh, let's say, sigma 1 and sigma 2 are our, our principal stresses, then sigma t is our maximum stress that the structure can take in tension, and my, uh, sigma the sigma c is our maximum uniaxial compressive stress in a way, right? And well, sigma 1 and sigma 2 are our compressive stresses, or our, our principal stresses, and this needs to be in this particular regime in which failure occurs, right? And, uh, and then we also said we, uh, we did not include any kind of uh, plastic growth or plasticity, crack initiation, fracture, failure. So far we just assumed that everything is linearly elastic and nice, right? But then that might not always be the case, uh, you might have lots of other things that are happening in there which might not necessarily lead you to a uh, simple 2D stress state like that. Right? So your stress is always, uh, so what, 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 are, what are the other ways to think about this? For example, let's say your stress state might not necessarily always be a nice, uh, you might not always be able to, you might always be able to calculate the principal stress, but that might not be a, always a criteria that you can use. Like I said, that's a very, very simplistic criteria to say, okay, my failure will occur if the stress is greater, the principal stress is greater than this failure stress. But then we, this was accounting that there was no plasticity or any other things occurring already in the element. But then once, once more complicated phenomena set in like plasticity, you might want to think twice about using such a criteria. For example, if you have a cast iron, right? If you have cast iron, you apply a uniaxial tensile test, it breaks in a brittle fashion, fact, uh, brittle fashion like, a, like, like glass, for example. Take glass, just drop it on the floor, it's going to crack, right? So there probably the whole idea of using the maximum principal stress holds nearly true. We need to be very cautious when I say true or nearly true there. Uh, material scientists would uh, slightly disagree with me on that. They'll probably be very angry about me if I, when I force me to state that. But if you take a material more like aluminum or steel, where there's a lot more ductility, then that might not hold true. Then you need to start thinking about what is the onset of failure and how do we think about it in a little more. So that is where your criteria about like, for example, like if you have like a more complicated material, things like one MeC stress comes into picture. I don't know if you've done one MeC stress, I don't want to go into it, but then there's just a term for you to think about and later explore when you try to do your finite element simulation. Try to, you can easily calculate your one MeC stress once you know your principal stresses, you can easily calculate your one MeC stress and see how it compares with regard to the yield limit of the material. For example, if you go online and look at, let's say, steel, what is the ultimate strength of steel? You, know, you can also get what is the yield limit of steel. 
when you did the uniaxial tensile test, or we saw that example there, it started to neck. There was a, like an area of necking, right? So, or this is where we call the material has started to yield. Now, most of the designs, we don't even want to go to the yield limit. Like if you're designing an aircraft, let's say you're, you're an aerospace engineer or aeronautical engineer, you're designing the wing of an aircraft, you don't want it to start yielding. Forget failure, you don't even want it to start yielding. So your, let's say your critical limit is already yielding, not even, not even failure, right? So you don't want your uh, you know, wing to have a plastic deformation, right? It's straight. After, after one flight, it probably just is a little bit crooked. Now it undergoes a little more plastic deformation on the second flight. After 200 flights, you know, your wing is like this, instead of like this, right? You don't want that to happen, right? So you don't want it to even plastically deform. You want it to be in your elastic regime. So then you start to think about what is my onset of failure or when does my material start to yield? So that's where your one Mises criteria comes into picture. Once you're able to calculate your principal stresses, for example, here in 3D, you're able to easily calculate your one Mises stresses and one Mises criteria as well in there, right? I'm not going to go into some of these other things that are there. For example, let's say, uh, things like that. For example, this is a very interesting case to think about when you're doing a finite element. It's, it's not very hard to set it up in ANSYS, a plate with a hole. You know, you just make, extrude a plate and then just extrude, uh, cut a hole. And uh, you can see the results. For example, you don't have to uh, do the entire plate. You can actually use the symmetry in the problem. When you go into a CFD part, I think the first lecture will focus a lot more on using these symmetries for your simulation. You never have to run your entire uh, body, but you can use the symmetry in the simulation. You know, you can cut the body into four pieces, and now it's symmetric around the x and y axis. So I just need to uh, do a simulation of the symmetric part, and that should give me an exact idea of uh, what would be the displacement on, on the stresses in the rest of the parts. You know, and one thing that you can probably see is that uh, when you do the simulation, okay, it's probably not here the video. Uh, you'll see that uh, this, uh, let's say the you'll see that there's a lot of stress concentration around these points, right? So we'll come back to that in a couple of seconds about these stress concentrations and so on, right? Okay, so it's kind of you don't, uh, like that's, that's what's called as a multi-axis uh, loading, in a way, so you generally don't always just think about uh, if the st maximum stress is greater than the principal stress or less than the principal stress, but you're more starting to think in terms of von Mises equations and so on, where you're thinking of a more complex multi-axial loading conditions and multi-axial failure. Because uh, seldom do you have a uniaxial state of stress, right? For example, let's say if you're designing a car or an aeroplane, it's not being like, stretched in a single direction, but then there's a multi-axis loading in there. So how do you think about that? So that's kind of where one Mises yield criteria comes into picture, because most often you're using ductile materials and so on, and you don't even want, to, want it to yield, forget about failure, okay? Right? So one of the most important things to keep in mind is that simulations are always wrong, okay? So simulations are always wrong. It's never a con correct. But then some simulations are more wrong than others. So the whole point comes down, how much error can I take? How much wrong simulation can I accept? Right? So is my simulation correct? You know, my students come and ask me, so I did the simulation, is it correct? No, it's wrong. It's always wrong. The question comes into it, how much of an error are we ready to accept? Right? So for example, like in a weather forecast, it says it's going to heavily rain today. You know, it's completely sunny. Right? That happens quite often. Sometimes they say it's going to rain, heavily, but then probably there's a moderate rain. That's acceptable error, right? So it's going to rain. I can take my umbrella out. If, I, if, I, if it's going to say, it's going to be like two degrees, you know, wear a nice jacket and go, and I go out in like completely sunny all through the day, I'm just carrying around my jacket unwantedly, right? So the same thing here, that that's like an error that I don't want. I want to at least say, okay, it's going to be sunny. You don't need to carry a jacket. Nice, right? At least that's an acceptable error, right? So if we want to think about what is an acceptable error in our finite element simulation. Right? So we talked about validation, we talked about uh, how to uh, you know, think of it in terms of like analytical solutions. Like I said, when, it's, when we were talking about earlier, we talked about analytical calculation. We said, for example, if this is the load I'm applying, this is the area of cross-section, I can lay F by A gives me a stress. If I know the English models of the material, I can get what should be my strain, and delta L by L should be approximately the strain that I should get, right? or delta L should be the displacement if I'm applying a load. Or if I'm applying delta L as my displacement boundary condition, this should be my reaction force. I can do a hand calculation or what's analytical calculation here in order to get some kind of a, let's say, feel of what should be the numbers. 
if my feel of the number is it should be probably about, uh, uh, let's say a reaction force should be about in kilopascals, and I'm getting a reaction force in gigapascals, then something is wrong there, right? So that's probably one, one way of looking at it. Second thing is probably to run an experiment, right? So one thing you can go to a lab, say, hey, I, I did this simulation, I want to run an experiment, and I want to see if my simulation is correct, right? Okay, so people used to do this in the like, 1970s and 80s. Uh, you, the people in the car industry used to do something called a crash test or impact test. I mean, even it's done today, but far less, more of it is done on a computer. Imagine you are a Mercedes or a BMW manufacturer or a Rolls-Royce manufacturer, right? So your engineer comes and says, hey, I tweaked the design of the door a little bit. We don't know how it will impact on the car. Let's go and crash a Rolls-Royce car, right? Every, every other day, you don't want to be crashing the Rolls-Royce car, right? Your, your employer will say, okay, this guy is like exp very expensive to keep on, keep us, you know, we need to let him go, right? So you need to think of intelligent ways of how to do it, but you can't do experiment for everything. Experiment needs to be run, but then you can't do always an experiment. There are lots of scenarios where you cannot do an experiment, right? So, for example, like one of the things that I, I'm working on at the moment is how blood flows in the brain and how that affects the tissue of the brain, right? So are there any volunteers who would probably give me your brain so I can like poke into it a little bit and see what happens? Probably not, right? So, so that, that's a situation where we really cannot experiment, you know. There are neurosurgeons who, are, who go in and take, uh, let's say, uh, snapshots and things like that that we use in our simulations to see if our simulation is right. But then there's a state where we can't do experiment, you know. For example, one of the things is like blood flow in the heart, and I can't pull out somebody's heart and say, okay, I'm now I'm going to measure the blood flow in your heart, right? So probably not possible. I mean, there are imaging techniques that give some analogous of that, but then these are extremely expensive and we want to minimize them. We want to minimize our experimentation because it's, uh, it's, it's sometimes impossible to do, sometimes it's super expensive, and sometimes it's just not sustainable. Let's say, for example, if you're drilling a metal and throwing out a lot of stuff every day, then it's not a sustainable way to do things. So we want to kind of, kind of do as accurately as possible on simulations, right? Third thing is compared to previous results in the literature, right? I mean, you go to Google Scholar or something, say, okay, this, this somebody has done it, probably you can compare with that, right? But it's, again, not always the case. So one of the most easiest way to look at uh, if your simulation is giving a reasonable result is to look at the concept of mesh dependency, right? Or mesh convergence, right? Any idea about mesh convergence? Sir, the finer your mesh is, the closer you're going to get to Okay, so that, that, always, that always is a very interesting way of putting it. Right? So what's the real value, right? So then, uh, yeah. Isn't the real value that I'm talking about either a value that you get from a test or a value that you make with a, with a more accurate software on a bigger, better computer? We can use that as a reference. Okay, so the, the concept of real, real value is always tricky, you know, so for example, when I talk to people who do theoretical mechanics, you know, those who like writing equations and so on, rather than solving on a computer, they say, you know, I can get this equation and give me a real value, right? So you don't always have a real value. So what are we doing here when we say we are doing a mesh convergence, is we are looking at it, it's not about if our solution is going near to the real value, right? If we are only seeing if our solution is mesh independent, Right? So the term independent is very important. So what, what is happening, if you look at the trend here, so I have a number of degrees of freedom. What does number of degrees of freedom mean? How many unknowns do I have in, the, in this mesh? Right? So you have four different meshes. And as we can see, this mesh has less number of nodes. And as we go on the right side, the number of nodes in the uh, mesh has increased. So now if I think of this is a 2D problem, right? at each node I, know I don't know the displacement in X direction and displacement in Y direction. Right? So that means at each node, I have two degrees of freedom. So that node, other in other words, can move in x direction, or x direction, or it can move in the y direction. So it has two degrees of freedom. And I have like, let's say, more number of nodes in, as, as we go along. So I can find out number of nodes into number of unknowns at each of these points, right? So that is the total degrees of freedom of that problem, right? For example, here we are talking and looking at a simple displacement problem. For example, if you look at CFD or something, it can be velocity and pressure, then you might have more. Or if you look at a 3D problem, you might have three unknowns at each node, right? So number of nodes into number of unknowns at each of these nodes. And there's a pure displacement, we have two unknowns. So number of unknown nodes into two here. That's our x-axis. What if you look at it, it's 10 power 3, 10 power 4, 10 power 5. 
most often we try to plot it in terms of like a log, semi log plot. Right? Why? Because most often you are trying to double your mesh size. So I have like 100 nodes here. I go into 200, 400, 800. 1,600, 3,200, 32,000, and so on. 3,200, and so on. So every time I do a mesh convergence, next mesh is generally double the size of what I had previously. So in answers, you can define the element length or element size. All you're doing is making that element size into half and half and half every time. right? And what I'm going to do here, I'm plotting the stress. So what is the stress? The stress is different at different points, right? So I'm going to plot stress at one particular point. For example, here we can see this red color thing. So there should have been a contour plot here, contour bar or color bar here that shows what this red and green mean. So generally, like sometimes uh, some, some of my students come and say, oh, hey, th 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 there's a lot of stress here. So I ask them, like, so why, why do you think there's stress at wherever there's red? Red doesn't mean that there's more stress. It just means it's like you've defined a color bar that says red is maximum, that green is the minimum, right? But then I can always invert it and uh, get the opposite of it, right? So without a color bar here, that means nothing. So I'm just I'm going to infer from what we have here from the problem that there should be a stress concentration at this particular point, right? Because we have some kind of a sharp point in there, there should likely be a stress concentration. So I'm going to assume that this stress here is going to be the maximum stress in that entire plate with a hole, right? If you do a simulation, you'll see that's actually the case. That is where the uh, cracks will start to uh, propagate, and that's where it will break if you do an experiment. Right? So now we have plotted the stress at this particular point with as we increase our mesh density. Mesh de so that, that's an important word again there, mesh density. So how dense is the mesh? We can see that our mesh has got one denser and denser. As you see, here we can see that the stress is converging to a particular value. Okay, so there's a straight black line that uh, one would say is a real value. There's no real value in there, right? Now, it, can it converge to a wrong value? Yes, it can converge to a wrong value. Right? Only it is, this is saying that our solution is mesh independent. Now, if I if I refine the mesh more and more and more, right? If I start to make elements smaller and smaller, mesh denser and denser and denser, I am not going to get any better result than this. Okay. So this probably this black line is my limit. Let's say if I do it a hundred more refinements, I'll probably end up with this black line, but nothing more than that. So that's what this mesh refinement study or a convergence study is telling us. It's not giving us a real value. It is only telling us that this solution that we are getting is mesh independent. Even if I make my mesh more and more, it is not going to make it any better. Right? So if we just plot, let's go here, and try to plot, let's say again, so let's say number of degrees of freedom. Okay? And let's say we... We plot our uh, solution. Right here, we are plotting some stress. So let's say, right? So we had some uh, value. Let's say, let me put a red line here. And our value, sorry, gone to black. Oh my God. Okay. And our value somehow, let's say, had this kind of a trend. Right. So now, let me on the right side plot processing time or compute time. I don't know how much or how many of you tried it in the lab, but probably it's a very nice thing to try. Try to make your mesh denser and denser and see how much time it takes on your computer. Right? As you will see, the more denser your mesh is, the larger our matrix size, if you remember in this class we started, that all of these things translate into a matrix. I think Charlie did it in the previous class where he had the trusses and each of these trusses was translated into a matrix. Your local element stiffness and everything assembles into a global element stiffness. So the more degrees of freedom you have, the larger is your element stiffness, your global stiffness. Okay? So now, that means that my matrix size is larger and my computer needs more time to solve it. Simple, right? So as we keep making our mesh density higher and higher, it, the amount of processing time is increasing, right? So you'll have something like, uh, let's okay, so let's try to write it in a different color. Okay. 
right? So this is our processing time, and this is our solution accuracy. So at some point, beyond some certain point, my processing time will kind of like in, ex exponentially increase. So let's say, for example, a simple finite element problem, up to two million degrees of freedom, or you know, up to two million unknowns, can be done reasonably fast. So after two million unknowns, most of the matrix solvers that you're using in general, you need a different kind of solver, what's known as an iterative solver. Up to about two to three million, you can use something called what's known as a direct solver. If you've done your Gauss Seidel methods and things like that, where you had a matrix equation and you just ever eliminated everything, like a Gaussian elimination, you eliminated everything to get a diagonal matrix, that's what your direct solver is doing. Now, you, as your matrix size becomes larger than that, using a direct solver becomes extremely expensive for it to do that. So you use something called an iterative solver. So iterative solver doesn't do that, but then kind of in iterations tries to get you to that point. Right? So uh, we, I'm not going into the details of that, but just something for you to think about later on if somebody wants to dig in. Uh, so your processing time is to going to go and go, go to go increases exponentially. So what I can say at some point, I have like a sweet spot here. Let's say this is my sweet spot. Okay, I can say that this is a nice spot where I have reasonably less compute time. I have about 95% accuracy, and I can live with it. Right. If I was a Swiss watch manufacturer, then I would probably say, no, no, I need a 99.9% .9 accuracy. Then probably you go on the right side. If you are, if you are like a, some manufacturer who needs like, okay, I am happy with 80% accuracy, go on the left side of this. Right? So, for example, I'm just uh, arbitrarily picking what my sweet spot is here to say that for my application, this is, sounds like a reasonable thing. Right? So you need to think about what is the application that you are modeling. Right? For example, if you're manufacturing a jet engine or something, then you want to go on the right side. Right? So you want to have much higher accurate solutions. You're not happy with a 90% accurate solution. So will my wing fly away in, during mid-flight? I have a 90% chance that it will not. There's a 10% chance it will break away. Right? So you don't want to really give that. You know, if you say that that's the thing, then I don't think you're going to get an approval to fly that flight. Right? So there's a 10% chance your wing will break away. Kind of. Nobody will sit on the flight. So, so, Think about, so that, that's the whole idea here. Your convergence here is not getting you to a right solution. It is getting you to a solution that is mesh independent. Right? If I increase the mesh size more, it's not going to increase my accuracy, or it's not going to make my solution any better. Right? But then, there are situations where, for example, let's say, if we, if we take a simple situation where we have like a, like a crack, let's, let's probably there's something like a, you can, anybody who's interested could try out, Right? So let's fix on one end, and let's apply some kind of a displacement. Okay. So now let's just uh, on this side. Let's uh, let me apply something of this nature, like a roller joint. Right. So I, I, what I've done here, I've fixed my bottom end. On the left side, I'm just fixing it like a roller thing because that's not my area of concern, and I'm going to apply some displacement on the top. Okay. So now. I'm going to go and look at the stress at this particular point, right? So that's my point of interest. At this point where I have a notch, keep refining your mesh more and more and more and more and more. Your stress will keep increasing. You will never reach a convergence. Doesn't matter how big your mesh gets, you'll not get a convergence. You should not get a convergence. If you're getting a convergence, then uh, let me know. I would be very interested about that. But you should never get a convergence there. Right? So it's because it's a stress concentration. Right? When you have sharp points, you have stress concentration. If you have stress concentration, that means the stress there is infinity. Right? You can never capture infinity. So the more refined your mesh gets, you're getting more near to infinity, but you'll never get to infinity. So the solution can never be mesh independent, right? So you need to be very careful about how you are looking around cracks or very sharp points. So these are some of the things that uh, are very important to think about when you're doing finite element to see is there a sharp point, right? So most of the designs, you'll, you, that, that, for example, when they started uh, uh, designing aircraft initially, they, if you, uh, I don't know how many of you know, they had the window to be a perfect rectangle or a square. There are nice sharp points in there. And then after a few flights, flights started to crack at these window edges. Right? Because you have a sharp point in there. Yeah, please. Wait, that's for the de Havilland comet, right? Sorry? De Havilland comet, because of the fatigue, because of the stress concentrations in the fatigue, and the airframe flow of the flight, right? 
Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, there are a lot of lot of things that happen in there. So, because of these stress concentrations, your your cracks can start to grow in there, and then once there's a crack initiated, so then the crack will start to propagate because of various reasons. It could be fatigue, it could be loading, it could be various things, right? So crack initiation itself is an open, open problem as to why does a crack initiate? Nobody knows, right? So people have their ideas as to why a crack initiates, but nobody knows why a crack initiates. So that's a whole philosophical topic which we're not going into. It's like opening a Pandora's box, okay? So, so like, like they say, pick one point of interest and try to plot this. So this is a very important plot when you, should, this, when you discuss a problem saying that, hey, I have a, I, I'm doing a finite element thing. I'm doing a CFD thing. You want to show your mesh convergence. This is the most critical thing to before somebody can trust your result. I have a mesh convergence plot. OK, now, OK, this result seems to be trustworthy. Let's look, at, look ahead, you know. Right? So that's the next step. So uh, any questions so far about post-processing, thinking about it? Okay, so just to summarize, so what did we think about? So first thing is, you put in your geometry, you put in your materials, you put in your boundary conditions, this is where your displacements are fixed, where your forces, where you're applying some forces, you run your simulation, then some magic happens behind, right? And once this magic happens, you get a nice color plot. Now, as engineers, what are you doing? You are going to say if this color plot makes sense. Otherwise, it's basically a color plot. I can take crayons and draw and give you a color plot. It's as good as that. So now, one thing to look about is to look at analytical calculation, to look at like hand calculation, to order of estimate analysis, to see, okay, does this make sense? Maybe run an experiment, that's not always possible. Compare with something that somebody has already run with an experiment, reasonably sometimes possible. And the most important thing to do as you is to look at if the solution that you have is mesh independent. That's the only thing that you can do. Is my solution mesh independent? So look at a convergence plot. Okay, now my mesh is, my, my solution is mesh independent, so that's reasonably trustworthy. Now there can now we have, we also have to look at the details of what kind of elements are using. Are you using a first order element, second order element? Does this this kind of element work for this kind of a material? There are a lot of other nitty gritties that you have to go into, but this is a very very basic check that you can do without having to worry about. Second thing is you can look at a stress, like for example, you can look at stress at a particular point. You can look at displacements at a particular point. This quantity can be anything. This quantity need not always be stress. Here we have taken an example of stress, but quantity can be anything. It can be displacement, it can be stresses, it can be your strains, it can be anything. It doesn't have to be necessarily be your stresses. Right? So the most important point is to keep in mind is to think about sharp points. Wherever you have a sharp point, you want to see if you can you know, blunt it out. Right? If it cannot be blunted, then you definitely have a stress concentration there. So how much ever you refine your mesh, you will never get a converse solution at that particular point. So taking that and kind of refining and refining and refining doesn't make any sense. So you want to look, why do, why do we want to refine? Like I said, we want to find what is the point at which I can say this, this is sufficient accuracy. I can take this mesh and run the solution and I'm happy with the accuracy I'm getting. Right? So that's all you can do when you're doing a finite element or any kind of numerical simulation to get your solution in there. Okay. Okay. So one last thing that's probably Charlie would want me to cover is to look at topology optimization. So this is something that's been of interest to a lot of people in the recent times. Okay. And the people have been, especially with the advent of 3D printing and things like that. Originally we were doing subtractive manufacturing where you take a block of metal and then you drill holes in it and remove material. With uh, additive manufacturing, you're essentially kind of printing your material, take a CAD model, divide into layers, and try to print it up. So you can really print out very, very complicated geometries with very minimal effort in there. Right? As you can see, people have been doing like uh, shoes to all the way till uh, Boeing air, air, uh, aircrafts and so on and so forth. Right? People have gone crazy about it. So why do we want to do this? One thing is basically if you can reduce the weight, then you can improve, uh, let's say, a lot of fuel efficiency, for example, in cars or in aircrafts and so on, right? So you want to make it as less, as light as possible, right? Second thing, you want to combine different materials, right, in order to ensure that you have the best property for that particular kind of an application. So these are the ideas that are there that went into kind of topology optimization. What can be the shape of my object so that it can take the loads that I want to apply on this object? or in this application, right? If I have a car, like for example, these are the, this is a typical road profile, this is a typical loading coming on the car. 
then what should be the structure of the car so that that can take the uh, shape of it, right? That, that can take these loads in a most optimal way, you know, we, by reducing the weight of the car, right? Same thing with an aircraft. You want to reduce the weight of aircraft, you want to make it lighter, you want to make it more fuel efficient, right? And travel long, longer distances at the same time, in a way, right? Okay, so just think of a very simple case of a topology optimization before we go ahead. So let's think that we have Lego blocks and uh, we have a simple cantilever beam, very simple case. Uh, let's not even go into this kind of a chair that kind of somebody designed in there. A simple cantilevered block, you have given Lego sets and you want to let's say 10 by 20 units, right? You have, you have a shear force at the end of it and you want to see what is the best way to design that, what should be the best shape of it, okay? So now one thing is you can take a block and apply the load and get the displacement, right? So alternatively, what you can also do is you can get some, some of these other designs in there. Like for example, let's say design C is very, very common. If you look at topology optimization, you'll come across this image quite often. You can de delete some of these blocks and say, every block I delete is probably, let's say, one kilogram reduced. So now I have 20 by 10, which is essentially like, let's say, 20 by 10 is gives me about 20 blocks. No, 20 by 10 is 200 blocks, sorry. Right? And if I remove some of this, let's say, that's like, let's say each block is one kilo, I have 200 kilos of my cantilever beam. Every block I delete can reduce, let's say, one kilo of it. Right? I want to reduce as much as possible, but be within my prescribed limits of displacements and uh, be able to take all the loads that are applied. Right? So now, there's nothing but a very combi uh, combinatorial problem. So if we go to, a, let's say, a combinatorix calculator, let's say we have about uh, 200 blocks, okay? And we want to, let's say, remove 50 of them. Let's say I want to reduce by 25%. Now that says that I, ha I have 1 into 10 to the power 53 ways of doing this, right? So if I have to, like, let's say, remove, let's say, just 25% of my blocks, let's say, reduce my weight by 25%, then I have, like, about 10 to the power 53 ways in doing it. Uh, but then I don't know if all these 10 to the power 53 ways would be able to take the def loads and be within the prescribed de deflection limits. So what, what is my problem? I have a cantilever beam. I'm going to say, okay, this cannot deflect more than some value y max, and it has to take a maximum load of some f max, right? Now we have like about 10 to power 53 designs that we want to test if it can take a load of f max, and if the deflection of this f max will be less than y max. Like if I have to run this many simulations, then it's going to I don't think I want to run them, right? So we want to think of a more intelligent way of designing things. So, so the most crudest way is like a getter design. Like, you know, remove some blocks, get a design, run a finite element simulation. Is it yes, no, yes, okay. Yes is okay, keep this design aside. No, okay, go get an next design, keep doing it, right? That's the most easiest way of doing things, right? Or most crudest way of thinking about it. But then we can't really do this. It's physically impossible to do that, right? So one of the questions they also have is like, which one has the highest stiffness now, right? So if I just have to say that, uh, give me one second. So if I just have to say that it has to take this load and say it has to be within this prescribed displacement limit, deflection limit, then that's one thing. Just find one of them, I'm happy with it. But then, which of this has the highest stiffness? That means I need to look at all the 10 to the power 53 options to say, okay, this is the best one, right? That's impossible to do it, right? So that's kind of where some of the ideas of topology optimization comes in, where you're not just looking at uh, the, uh, let's say, a simple finite element calculation, but you're trying to, like, let's say, optimally go into a path where you can remove these things. So how can I find, I'm not going to go into the details of this because that's probably something you'll be doing in either year three or year four, if somebody's staying in year four. Uh, but then, well, just, just to give you an idea of what you can do with finite elements, right? So you want to go in a path, let's say I removed block one, I want to go in a path so that my energy will still be minimized within the parameter limits, right? So what you're doing is you're minimizing your energy in a way, right? So again, so this is a bit tangentially thing. So again, like when you think about finite element, people don't think about it as first law of thermodynamics, right? So kind of first law of thermodynamics is different, finite element is different, solid mechanics is different, fluid mechanics is different, right? Each of these are different topics taught by different people and they're not connected to each other, right? But then, if you think about your principle of virtual work, right? So let's say if I go back to my cantilever beam, right? So let's go back to our cantilever beam. I'm applying a force. 
Now this force results in some form of a de deflection. Right? So there's some deflection, let's say delta. Right? So what's the work done here? Is nothing but F into delta. Right? So now I'm going to apply a force on this cantilever beam. Because I've applied some force, this is going to be a deflection, which means I've done some work. If I have to take this bottle from here and bring it down, there's some change in potential energy of the bottle. And how did that change? Because I did some work by moving it. Right? So now if I bring it back up, there was some work done on this bottle because of which there was a change in potential energy. Right? So you're, there's some work done because of which there's some change in energy. But then here, we applied some force. There was some deflection, which means that some work was done. But where did this go into? Any thoughts? So according to our first law of thermodynamics, this, this, this is violating our first law of thermodynamics. So what, what first law of thermodynamics is not just our jet engine, but everything should conform to it. If I'm doing a process that's increasing, that's not increasing my entropy, but decreasing the entropy of the overall universe, that means that that process should not happen, right? That will be violating our second law of thermodynamics. But then here I violated my first law of thermodynamics by doing some work on the beam, but then this energy suddenly vanished. But then this energy did not vanish. In your solid mechanics or structural mechanics or strength of material, whatever you call the course name, you have something called strain energy density. So you define this as half into sigma into strain, if you remember. So this strain energy density is density, strain energy per unit volume, or, right? <laughs> volume. In other words, if I take the cantilever beam, so since there's a deflection, that means there's a strain there, right? At every point, I can calculate the stress and the strain. If I integrate it over the entire volume, there's a total strain energy stored in your beam, right? F into delta work done on the beam. So let me call this E1, I call this W, so that means my W minus E1 should be equal to 0, assuming that there are no other external factors at the moment, right? We never thought of it this way, right? So I am applying a force, which means I am doing a work, this work is energy, as per the first law of thermodynamics, that should be conserved. So it's going to be stored inside the beam as strain energy density, or strain energy. If you think of your car bumper, right? So what's the purpose of your car bumper, right? Imagine if your car bumper was like a rubber material, right? right? Imagine it's a pure rubber material, like a jelly. You go and crash it to a wall. What is going to happen? It, jelly is going to deform, then it's going to come back to its original state, right? If your car goes and hits a wall, it's going to be pushed back, woof, right? Think of it, take a jelly and put your hand on it. What's going to happen? It's going to come back or take your damper, right, in your, in your car, push it down, it's going to push you back, because it's purely elastic, right? But then what's happening in your car bumper? As you go and hit the wall, it is undergoing a plastic deformation. It's going undergoing some dissipation. It is storing, let's say I had some kinetic energy, my car was traveling at, let's say, 70 miles an hour, I had some kinetic energy. Within a few microseconds or milliseconds, I'm coming to a halt, right? So all that kinetic energy that was there, half into m into v square, has to go somewhere. It cannot poof, vanish. What is your bumper doing? It's going to first deform. Then your, then your car, let's say the bonnet starts to deform. Now, as, as soon as your accident is, as soon as you hit it, you're not going to come back. Everything doesn't come back to its original shape. It stays in the deformed shape. 
whatever kinetic energy you had is stored in the deformed shape of your car. Right? So energy is not going anywhere. It's, everything is first law of thermodynamics and second law of thermodynamics. So where does second law of thermodynamics come into picture? So I'm going to say my stress is nothing but x modulus into strain. Right? So the most simplest material model. For example, for uh, somebody who is more interested, you can look up at hyperelastic material. Or, or for example, viscoplastic material. Right? By default, your linear elasticity is satisfying the second law of thermodynamics. Your stress is related to your strain in such a way that it always leads to increase in entropy or, uh, right? But then, you can come up with a complicated material model. I can go tomorrow and write stress is equal to some A into B into C into, or something into straight, right? I can write a function. What stops me from writing that? Second law of thermodynamics stops me from writing that, right? So your material law that you have, or a material model that you are using needs to conform to second law of thermodynamics. So the first of thermodynamics is essentially what you're doing in finite element. So you're taking this thing, you're saying, let's say my function is W minus E, and I want to minimize this. So what's the minimum of that is zero. I have A, I want to check if A equal to B, right? Tell the computer is A equal to B. Instead, it's easier to check if A minus B equal to zero, right? So we are trying to find what is the total energy stored in the body? What is the work we are doing? And A minus B, what is it equal to zero? Can we get it to zero? Can I find the potential displacement vector or displaced degree of unknowns such that the work done by the external forces, which results in this set of displacement, will lead me to such that there's an energy balance? So I'm doing nothing but you're doing your thermodynamics in there. Your finite element is nothing but thermodynamics, where it's kind of trying to say what's the work done, right? So for example, let's say if you take a simple plate, I'm going to fix one end of it. Let's say we divide it into some n number of elements, right? So each of these nodes, let's say u, has ux and uy. If I take all the number of nodes, let's say I have like 5 into 5, 25 nodes, into two unknowns, that's 50 combinations. 50 numbers can have any value. What is it stopping from having a value that is physically admissible, right? If I apply a load, I can get any value. I can write ux equal to anything. It need not be zero, it can be one, it can be two, it can be three, anything, right? What is stopping it from, for example, all I'm doing is I'm prescribing a boundary condition that u here is zero. Let's say I'm going to apply some displacement on these. Let's say u equal to one. For example, let's say this node, let's say u, can be anything. On the left side, I prescribe it to be zero. Right side, I prescribe it to be one. But you in the middle is what I'm solving for. It can be anything. What stops it from being anything is that it has to satisfy all the combinations of U has to satisfy first law of thermodynamics, right? Okay. Sorry, I digressed a little bit in this. So essentially, that's what we are doing when we say minimizing the strain energy. We are trying to find a, a scenario where the displacements of all of these different nodes will still lead to a minimum potential energy, right? Or in other words, the work done minus that energy has to be equal to zero. When I'm saying I'm minimizing, I'm trying to get it to zero. What is a zero for a computer? Is 10 to the power minus 3 a zero, 10 to the power minus 6 a zero, 10 to the power minus 16 a zero, 10 to the power minus 32 a zero, 10 to the power minus 200 a zero, right? For you, 10 to the power minus 200 doesn't mean anything. It's probably a zero, right? But probably for somebody, 10 to the power minus 3 is a zero. Okay, I don't care about the third decimal digit already. So what is a zero? That's the biggest question. You're telling a computer, minimize it, and then saying it, okay, if it's less than this particular value, let's assume it's a zero. You're applying a convergence criteria, so that's what it says here. Converge, yes or no? So what does it mean by converged? Is A minus B less than some 10 to power minus something. Because I, 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 I am going to specify what this thing, thing is. For example, if you go to your answers, you can change your convergence criteria. Most often commercial softwares have this criteria very high, 10 power minus 3 or minus 4. Because they want to, they want to give you a solution. 90% okay? of the problems should give a solution on the software. 
and it's your problem to find if it's correct. Their problem is to make sure their software works. Their problem is not to give you a right answer or software that gives you a right answer. Their problem is to make sure, see my software is running for this problem. You as engineer need to determine if you, the solution you got is correct or not. I don't care, you know, that's not my problem. Okay? But then you have to decide. So, for example, if you take an open source software, right? There are a lot of, give open source finite element software, lots of them are there. Their convergence criteria will probably be a much smaller, 10 to the power minus 8 or minus 16 instead of 10 to the power minus 3. Sometimes you say, this software doesn't work, it's garbage. No, it's not garbage, it's just that the criteria at which it says you have a solution is much higher. It's more stricter. It makes sure that it, you're really converged. Right? A minus B is 0 0.001, okay, that's converged. But then if you want to look at an accuracy of much higher than a millimeter, then that's not really converged, right? So it depends on what you're using. You need to look at your convergence criteria when you're working with ANSYS to see what is the convergence criteria it gives. And based on that, then you can think about it. Here's my application. I'm, I'm designing a jet, right? Probably a meter long, and I'm looking at a one millimeter is okay for me. Maybe, maybe not, depending on what you're designing in the jet. Okay? Right? So you need to think about, so that's what you mean by convergence criteria in there, if it converges or not. So you're going to minimize your strain energy density in order to find different kinds of displacement topologies and so on and so forth. A lot of this work is being done now, and I'm not going to go into the details of it, just give you some examples of it, and uh, leave you to think about it, and uh, happy to answer any questions if they are there. Right? For example, this is an example of a, a wheel cover that is there. So where that, if you look at it on the top left, is where you have the first wheel cover, which is, the weight says is 33.582, and you want to try to reduce that as much as possible. Simple thing is to think about mesh, start with a mesh, try to delete elements and see if it's still be able to take the same load, it still has the reasonable stiffness, is able to uh, account for the acceptable set of deflections and so on. And as you see, if you can look at it, uh, you'll see that uh, the weight starts to reduce uh, quite a bit as we go on. So it comes down all the way to, let's say, first standard iteration, optimized wheel cover, first iteration, which is optimized. On the bottom right, you can here you can see the weight is somewhere around 24, 25 kilos, where you started with about 33 kilos. That's about uh, 8 kilos, which is almost about 25% uh, weight reduction, right? So what you're doing here, if you can see, you've created a lot of holes in a way. So I call this, I call this work as poking holes. You know? Take a mesh and start to delete your elements and see if it works. But the whole critical thing is where to start deleting from, how to delete them, and so on. Right? So there's a very interesting application of finite element where they can, you can kind of use these things. To, so again, if you go to a third iteration and a fourth iteration and so on, you can pretty much see that the weight has come all the way down to about 19 kilos here for this wheel base, which is we started about 33, which is about nearly 50% reduction in weight. Right? So the, I mean, these are very, very interesting uh, things that can be done. A similar scenario, for example, like a base plate, where you start with about 26 kilos, and with several iterations and so on, you come all the way to about 16, yeah, I think about 16, probably less, yeah, or 15 kilos in a way, up to about 15. So that's pretty much, again, like a 50% reduction in weight. So most of the things, ideas when you started designing were thinking about subtractive manufacturing, where can I manufacture these things? And now the whole idea has come down to additive manufacturing where you can 3D print things. But then again, you can come up with a very complicated shape, but then how do you know that you can manufacture it, right? So that's another challenge. So one of the things is, challenging things, for example, is mesh dependency. I think uh, that was something that was shown there, or maybe in the next slide we can see that. Yeah, so you can see that if you start with three different meshes, you can end up with three different designs at the end of it, right? Because at the end of the day, you're basically deleting elements from this mesh, so it's a hugely mesh dependent process. So you need to start with a reasonable mesh that you think will give a good solution, but then even then you might, each of these meshes might end up with a very, very different solution when you're doing topology optimization, right? So if there's a huge amount of mesh dependency in these kinds of uh, problems. Second thing is time consuming finite element. For example, you're doing a, in, a, in the lab, you're doing a, a linear finite elements, which is reasonably faster to run. But then again, if your mesh size starts to become bigger and bigger, then time cons it consumed is higher and higher. Now, if you start to do more nonlinear finite element, plasticity like and uh, viscoelasticity and so on, then it's even more expensive to do these simulations. Right? And some of the things you can't do it on your computer, you probably need to run on supercomputer or what are the high-performance computers and so on and so forth. 
So third thing is a manufacturing constraint. Like I said, so the whole idea is can I manufacture these things? So for example, I came up with a very, very nice complicated shape like that by poking a lot of holes into my specimen, but can I manufacture that? Yeah, with additive manufacturing, you can do a lot of stuff, but still it might not necessarily be manufacturable. I came up with a design, but it's not manufacturable, right? So you want to think of, uh, how do I manufacture? For example, it's not just thinking of poking holes and removing elements, reducing the stiffness or increasing the stiffness, uh, making sure that in within the constraints, reducing the weight, but also add a constraint, can I manufacture this? If I do this change, is my specimen that I have now still manufacturable? What are the steps that I can take in order to manufacture this component? Right? So that I allows you to remove out things that are not manufacturable. If you come out with something that's very fantastic, looks very nice, but I can't manufacture, then that's kind of useless, pretty much. Right? So, for example, yeah. So, yeah. I think this is probably more interesting to look at at the end. I think we have a few more minutes. So this was a simple experiment that was done by Charlie. And uh, so you have two structures. So both of them, I think, uh, are like reasonably, like it's not a block, but then you've done some topology optimizations with them. And you have, on the first thing on the left side, you're applying the same loading, let's say. So we can just enhance the image to, um, probably not, let's see. No, no. Okay. So let's try to make this bigger. So you can see here that the load is 62. Well, if you look at this meter here, you can see that the reading on both of them are 62. So you're applying about 62 newtons of load. And the displacement on one of them is about 2.1 on millimeter, while on the other is about 4 millimeter. Like on the left one is like, see, left one should probably be a lot more compliant by just looking at it. But it seems like the right one is a lot more compliant than the left one. Right? If you just look at it, like left one seems to have a lot more holes in there, so it should probably bend a lot more if you're applying a bending load, but that's not necessarily the case, but then the right one is taking the bending a lot more and being a lot more compliant. I mean, similar thing, under the same displacement of three millimeters, what is the reaction force of both of these structures? You can see that the, the structure on the left side is able to hold up to about 90 newtons, while the structure on the right side is about 58 newtons versus 90 newtons in the way. Right? So it's not necessarily that something that looks with a lot of holes is less uh, stiff or less uh, more compliant, or something with less holes is, uh, let's say, less more less compliant and more stiff, right? So it, you need to do some of these simulations and experiments in order to understand what for what what works better, what doesn't work better, and. Uh, uh, when, you're, when you're doing these topology optimizations. So that's where your finite element simulations come in, in order to minimize your strain energy density and look at different configurations as well. Okay, so I'll leave you guys at this point. So it's about 2.45. So we have 15 minutes left out, so five minutes for any questions and 10 minutes if the next lecturer wants to come in. Thank you very much. And uh, I think then you have the third next lab. Uh, I think that's what I understand. So there's a lab sheet as well that's available in the presentation online. And uh, I think there's, a, there's some break before you have the fourth lecture, if I'm right. Thank you very much and have a nice week. Thank you very much, Doc. Thank you.
If I have a simple, hi, give me a second. So let's say if I are going with simple uni accident, right? So let's say apply a load here. So let's say if I take any point here, I can think of this as an infinitesimal element around that point. So if for at any point you can always calculate your let's say your stresses, right? So since the 2D case, you have sigma x, x, y, y, and tau x, y, right? So that's or you can write it in a matrix form as x, x. Y Y, O X Y, O X Y. Right? Yeah, but like, how do we know like this uh, shear stress is this this like this spot? Like, why is it? Well, how do you convert from this form to this form? Uh, okay, so this this is standard convention in how you write. Uh, okay. yeah. Or if you can write this also in a 3D matrix because you generally are always looking at a 3D problem as a, something like sigma x, x sigma y y, sigma z z. So this is your tau x y, tau x y. Tau x z, tau x z, tau y z, tau y z. So it's just a convention. It's a convention. Yeah. Oh, what was the name of this convention? Sorry? What was the name of this convention? Was it like? It is standard convention. And, and always you should think you should, you should remember that this is your, it is always symmetric matrix. So this is the same as this, and this is same as this. Okay. But how do you use this in like in the FEA? Like what does this like what do you like equate to? Uh, so we don't exactly use this. We use that idea to draw your more circle. Okay. Oh. And more circle gives you sigma one and sigma two, which is nothing but your principal stress. Yeah. So now when you do some simulation like this, for example I have a stress like this, let's say stress that x, x, y, y, z, tau x, y. From here I can write, let's say I can get my sigma one and sigma two. Right? So when you do finite element simulation, you have the stress state at every point. From there you can get your what's it, you can calculate what is sigma one and sigma two. I mean answers can also calculate this for you, but you can also do it by hand. And from here you can always compare a sigma one and less than your sigma fracture. So it gives you an easy way to see if your structure will fail or not. This is only if you go by uh, one business So this is by like maximum principal shear stress. Maximum principal stress. Principal stress. Yeah. What if you want to go by like shear stress? Right? And then, then, then you, you calculate over your one mc stress and then compare it at its less than sigma e. So this becomes a real deep stress. So this is your ultimate stress. So this is a stress at which your material will fail. This is a stress at which it will start to yield. You know, you have a plasticity like this. If you've got your sigma stress and strain, you have a linear region, and then it'll start to yield, and then it'll start to fracture. This is your sigma F, this is your sigma Y. Okay, yeah. Uh, we've got a lot of questions. Yes, well, this, like, so how do you go from like this is the original design? Right, right. right. And this, like, do you go from this here first, or do you go to this first? So you, you get your, uh, doesn't matter, like basically it's like basically it's saying like if you iterate, so basically you kind of like, you, you never get to one place at one point, right? You're always making an iteration. I go to this, I check it from there, and then I do the next one, I iterate here. So basically like a like standard iteration in a way. And here basically you kind of like, you take this one, you optimize that, and then you iterate on that one. So, so this? This is basically like if I just take this one and do a standard iteration, standard need of here I do a topology optimization and then again I do an iteration on that. Like you know, it's a kind of iterating and iterating in a way. Okay. So, so based on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Create the space. So the convergence means that it's this is what it is after it converges. Yeah. So convergence essentially means like if your solution is uh, first day, like what's your criteria? Like you know, I want to reduce the weight. Uh, then you have a weight limit in which it should be. Like I need to have like a you know, magnitude take maximum of this much force. You know, but then its deflection should be less than this. So what also your convergence criteria essentially means that uh, are you satisfying all the criteria? So you made a design change, now you run a finite element, check if you're satisfying all the design criteria. If not you go back and again make a change. Like an iterative process. If you have any questions, you can always email me. Right. I don't have any academic queries or anything. That's okay. uh, I just emailed the Manchester. I don't know if you are like uh, associated with the Manchester or CFD team. Okay, no, uh, I know who, who does. Ramir is the head of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, and I emailed them uh -huh. today morning and they said that they weren't, there weren't any placements uh, like, uh, for the summer. Okay. I just wanted to uh, like understand that uh, I can like intern with a PhD student or is that something a possibility? Yeah, you can, you can always you can always do that. You can always intern. So CFD Manchester is just run by one professor. It's okay. not, it does not comprise of everybody in a CFD. Okay, okay, okay. So I think there's a bit of a misnomer there, but it doesn't comprise of everybody in a CFD group. It is just one person who is doing the C one CFD person who has to have. Okay, okay. So I can still like. Yeah. Okay. So you, you can always intern. So, so there's a school of engineering internship. I that understand that, but I mean, I was hoping to like work on something like that I wanted to research rather than okay. the project that the university already has. I mean, I don't mind applying to those. Uh -huh. I just thought that if I could apply, it, like if I could research on some of the few topics that I actually want to work on. Okay. So what are the so topics if there are that any you want opportunities for that as well? I just wanted to ask. So, but what are the topics you want to work on? Um, I have made a list, and I've also spoken to um, the professor who teaches us uh, numerical computing and uh, Milan. Yeah, exactly, Professor Milan. And he also said to me uh, that come up with a list, and then we can okay. discuss something. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. I don't think you're much different. You're probably been passing maybe. Probably, probably. Hi. So you're teaching dynamics, I guess. That's uh, you. Modeling and simulation. Mock sets. Right. So this is your second year, right? Yeah. Right. I think one time it was last year doing this post presentation. I think you briefly. Probably, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, good, good to see you again. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.